G'day everyone, my name's Belinda and this is Russell and we're from Gallivanting Oz. Now what we do is we help make awesome motorhome holidays around Australia happen. We do that with motorhome hire, four-wheel drive camper hire and of course our popular escorted motorhome tours. Now we're lucky, not only do we get to chat with our clients before they head off, we also get to have a chat with them when they return. Now we often ask them what was one of their more sort of favourite or memorable experiences while they were on the road. Now apart from the obvious or the usual highlights, we often get told it's happy hour. The people they get to meet around the campfire, the travel stories that are told, and just, you know, I guess hearing about the new places they might be able to see and do the next day. So Russell, would you say that happy hour is the core ingredient of any good road trip? Absolutely. And Belinda and I would like to invite you to come and join us at our happy hour while we share a few tales. So grab yourself a couple of drinks and a few mates and come back and join us. Just press pause now and we'll be here when you get back. Welcome back to our happy hour. So you've got yourself your beverage, you've got your favourite travel buddies. Now let's have a bit of a chat about some of our more favourite places we've been to. We might inspire you to go somewhere new or perhaps you can reminisce and agree with some of our favourite spots as well. So as you can probably tell by now, one of Belinda's my favourite things on any motorhome trip is the happy hour and sharing our tales of our experiences as we've travelled all around Australia. We'd love to hear the areas that you'd like us to talk about as we share our next happy hour tale. So please provide your feedback and maybe if you've got a story or two to tell yourself, we'd love to hear that as well. Today, we're gonna to be having a look around Kakadu, Litchfield, sharing a couple of our favorite uh, motorhome choices that you might be interested in to know about. And just give you a few tips and probably tell you a few things you didn't know about Australia already. All right, let's get started. So Russell, why don't you tell us about your favorite spot in Australia? Kakadu National Park is definitely one of my favorite spots in Australia. And should we show people where it is before we start talking about it? Yeah. So you'll see on the map there that it's part of Northern Territory and it borders Arnhem Land and it's about three hours east of Darwin. That's right, and you just turn off at Humpty Doo. Yeah, you know, what a great name for a place. And even more interesting, Humpty Doo is renowned for its barramundi farms and a lot of the commercial barramundi that you see in Australia comes from Humpty Doo. But as you go through it, you think <laughs> I'm crazy because it doesn't look like no. anything. It is a, a good place to pick up your uh, supplies too. It's got a supermarket there. Um, do you think that everybody knows what a barramundi is, Russell? Ah, oh, if you don't, when you go to Kakadu National Park, you'll know <laughs> that it's an iconic fish that Australians love both to catch and to eat. The variety of things to do, it, it pleases everyone. Wildlife is world renowned. The, the scenery, the natural wonders are one of the reasons why it's actually World Heritage listed. And then you've got the Aboriginal culture, where Kakadu is one of the truly magnificent places for, for Ab Aboriginal culture. And it is actually the second reason that it is a World Heritage listed area. Yeah, that's right. And do you remember the um, cultural centres? How they're also very good in Kakadu National Park too, and that's included in your permit. Yeah, and, and the assistance you get around those cultural centres is really good. And if you want to learn anything at all about Aboriginal culture, go and ask the people at those centres and they're more than happy to share all their knowledge with you. Mm. I was just thinking, just as you were talking then, um, I'd have to say Kakadu is probably one of my favourite too, but what I really like about Kakadu National Park is that when you mentioned about the wildlife, I was thinking about that dawn cruise, you know, at Coinda. Yeah, yellow, yellow waters. Yeah. The dawn cruise there is, I think, has got to be on everyone's bucket list. Mm. It's one of the... Just seeing the steam come up in the morning, oh, yeah. you know, as the, as the sun's rising, the steam's coming up, the bird life starting to come to life. Yep. The the uh, skyline and the colours yeah. really is. We've been so lucky. Like, how many times have we done that cruise? 
Uh, I've lost count of how many times, but I can tell you, I will never get sick of it. And every time's a new experience yeah. in its own particular way. Yeah, and we always see great wildlife, but what I've also noticed is it's not a cookie cutter approach as to with the rangers, you know, with the, the way that they talk. Do you feel like you learn something every time we go there? And um, I guess we're lucky, we know a lot about Australia. Yeah, the rangers are first class. Mm. They know their stuff, you can tell they're passionate about it. Mm and they will always find crocodiles, yeah. you know, huge variety of birds, the occasional buffalo or pig or something random like that. Oh, do you remember the sawtooth uh, shark? Yeah, absolutely. One of the most endangered species in the world and we were lucky enough to see one right beside our boat, nearly five metres long. Yeah. The ranger was so excited. You could tell it was a, it was a special thing for him as well. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, we always make sure that Kiwinda's on our list when we go through Kakadu, don't we? And we've done that at different times of the year too. So if you find yourself up at uh, Kakadu during the wet season, then that's actually usually still running. It just is a slightly different experience. Probably should mention, um, just so people do know, that the best time to go to Kakadu National Park or anywhere in the top half of Australia is really through that May to September period. And that's what's referred to as the dry season. We've talked about the wildlife. Um, there's some other places that are also worth a visit, would you say? Yeah, so um, Nulangi and Ubia are two, two places that yep. come to mind. And it's so great because you get to those on a sealed road as well. Both have awesome rock art. Uh, do you remember what happened when we were at Nulangi? Yeah, we came across a black wallaby and we were there with my dad at the time and uh, he got so excited. Mm. We couldn't believe it and it was actually our first trip to Kakadu. So, uh, I don't think we were quite as excited as him because no. we were thinking, oh, you know, he's talking about a rare black wallaby and boom, it's sitting right there. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Luckily we got photos though because we, we now know how lucky we were because yeah. even rangers didn't believe that we saw a, saw a black wallaby yeah. until we showed them photographs. Yeah. And we've never seen one since <laughs> after <laughs> all those trips back there. And the other place, you know, we talked about was Yubea. That's another great place to see the rock out. And then that walk up to the lookout. Yeah. And once you get to the lookout and you're overseeing that floodplain, oh, yeah. you can't help but feel as though you're part of Kakadu as you the expanse of the floodplain, taking in the culture. And when you take that moment, it's, it really does hit you yeah. that you're somewhere special. And I think it's because it's so different to many other places, I guess even around the world. Seeing the floodplain, seeing the red and rocky, it's just kind of a bit unique in that way, isn't it? Yeah. Some people just say it looks like Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> oh, I don't I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Most of Kakadu National Park is on a sealed road access. However, there are a couple of places that we've been to when we've been lucky enough to have a four-wheel drive camper. Um, do you remember, it was not even really off the beaten track, it's still fairly popular, but Twin Falls and Jim Jim Falls. Do you remember going there? Yeah, absolutely. And we, we had one of the Apollo four-wheel drive campers. Yep and it was perfect vehicle for it, but you do have to make sure you get permission uh, before going in there because yeah. the conditions do change there quite quickly. Yeah, so there is a river crossing to get through to Twin Falls in particular. It's actually, do you remember how it was 80 centimetres when we went through? Yeah. Which is pretty deep for a, a crossing, but you know, we got permission, no problems, but it's not a fast moving river, so that's what um, makes a bit of a difference in that case. And it was so worth it. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When you get to those falls, it was, a truly amazing experience and the yeah. boat ride up there. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, there's not too many trips where you get to have the boat ride, four wheel drive trip and you get to have some walking in there as well because yeah. it's a beautiful walk up to Twin Falls. And what I also remember about that is um, while most people would just walk to the bottom of the falls, there is that walk, you know, you go up around the side to the top of the falls. And I remember that was one of the few places in that particular area where I had internet reception I had to check in with the office. I couldn't put it on video chat that day because, <laughs> you know, it's supposed to be working, I suppose. But, you know, it's just so nice that if you sometimes have to check in, you can do it in such amazing surroundings. Yeah, hey. Absolutely. And do you remember how the river just disappeared into the bottom of the rocks? Oh, how awesome was that? Yeah, yeah that was good. So I think you can, uh, well not think, I know you can do a um, four-wheel drive day trip from Kawinda if you're not going to have a four-wheel drive for this trip. Um, a lot of people just do 
prefer to have the two-wheel drive motorhome for Kakadu. I might just mention about um, camping because that's something that people might like to know about. Yeah, just before you touch on camping, yep. you can also do those helicopter and flights over over Jim Jim and uh, Twin Falls as well. Yeah, so you can do that before the road opens. So once the road opens, you're not actually able to fly over that, that area. But it's a great way if you're the uh, sort of earlier in the, earlier in the dry season, because that um, area doesn't usually open till June is an early time for it to open in the, in the season. And do you remember how there was that campground actually near Jim Jim Falls yeah, too? Yeah, So that was pretty yeah. handy. So it's not such a long drive in the morning because it can be a bit busy. So do you remember how we went super early? Yeah. Like we were one of the first people to leave the camp? Yep. So camping in Kakadu. Yep. Uh, we, um, we've stayed in a few places and uh, on our tours we stay at Coinda, which is uh, beside that, that cruise that we spoke about at Yellow Waters. But there's a number of varieties of camping in Kakadu and a lot of a lot of national park camping where yeah. it's... So first in, first serve for yeah. the national park camping. You can't pre-book that. And it's also unpowered, but it's perfect if you want to experience a bit more rustic. Um, in Jabiru, there's also uh, three or four different caravan or commercial caravan parks. Some of those take bookings and some don't, but uh, the ones that don't are uh, pretty large, so you usually don't have a problem getting yourself a powered site when you're in Jabiru. Mm. Particularly if you want your aircon running if you're in your two-wheel drive motorhome. <laughs> So what sort of motorhomes would you recommend for people travelling around Kakadu? Well, that probably depends on their interests a little. The majority of our clients tend to take either a two-birth toilet and shower motorhome. And I'm actually going to show you um, at the end of this a little bit more about that. And also um, the six-birth motorhome, even if you're only a couple, is pretty popular for those that like to spread out. So two-wheel drive motorhome with the toilet and shower seems to be most popular. Uh, for people like us who wanted to get off the road a little bit more, off the main beaten track, or if you've got Jim Jim or Twin Falls on your bucket list, then you'd be wanting to look at a four-wheel drive camper. We've got a few options. Our favourite, which is this one here, the four-wheel drive adventure, Apollo adventure camper. Um, otherwise, we've got roof tent options as well, depending how adventurous you want to be. Russell, when you think of Kakadu and you think about how long you might like to spend in Kakadu, how long would you suggest? Well, I think uh, I, I think you can easily spend like you know, between two and four days. Most of our clients are probably similar to that. So they usually allocate in their, usually Kakadu tends to be part of a longer trip. Perhaps Darwin down to Adelaide or Perth to Darwin, for example. But I've actually had other clients spend, you know, seven to 10 days in there because there's pretty awesome walks, you know. Yeah. Or if you want to do a bit of fishing, there's oh. fantastic fishing there. and that does, about the Barramundi? That does take up a little bit of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how'd you go with your Barramundi fishing, Russell? I love Barramundi fishing. Unfortunately, Barramundi fishing doesn't love me. <laughs> In fact, a great place to catch Barramundi is Cahill's Crossing, which is the border between Arnhem Land and Kakadu. Oh, yeah. And there's a causeway that goes over it. And at the right tide, the water goes over the causeway and the crocodiles line up to catch the barramundi as they go over the, the causeway. Yeah. It's also a great opportunity for you to grab that rod, throw it in and see if you can catch a barramundi oh, yeah. for yourself. <laughs> Actually, don't throw the rod in. That would be stupid. <laughs> Use the lure to try and catch the barramundi. <laughs> Throwing a rod in, that is why I'm a hopeless barramundi fisherman and you should never take tips from yeah. me. Yeah. It's interesting that uh, causeway across into Arnhem Land, isn't it? So if you're there in the dry season, sometimes it's underwater and sometimes it's not. Yeah. But that's where um, the, it actually you cannot, cannot drive through there in the, in the wet season, can you? No, and even in the dry season, uh, it's got to be at the right tides and the yeah. right levels. Any motorhome that you hire, whether it be a four-wheel drive or a two-wheel drive, is not allowed to go over that causeway. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, so, you know, for um, everyone out there who's thinking of it as something they might like to tempt, don't. <laughs> don't, yeah, don't. And at low tide, you'll probably see a number of vehicles yeah. uh, off the side of that causeway, and that is why you're not allowed to cross it. Yeah, it can move there pretty fast, can't yeah, it? it can. Yeah. That was so great, just reminiscing and just reliving some of our great uh, times up in Kakadu National Park, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Reminds me why it's one of my favourite places in Australia. Yeah. Just the memories and telling those tales again. Yeah, it's just the perfect happy hour. It is. And actually, you might have been to Kakadu already and enjoyed reminiscing over the photos as well. Or perhaps we've inspired you to include Kakadu on one of your next adventures in Australia. So remember, you can do that from Darwin. It's perhaps a shorter trip. Or you might like to tack it on if you're going to perhaps Adelaide or Perth or 
down to Brisbane, which is one of our favourites, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So now might be a great time for you to grab another beverage because we've got another little secret spot in the top end. Oh. Is it secret? No, it's not secret <laughs> at all, but it is a fantastic place and you'll yeah. really love hearing the stories about it yep. and hopefully inspiring you to go there as well. So maybe just press pause, grab that bevy and we'll see you shortly. Welcome back. Hope you got another beverage and you're, uh, you're ready to hear about our next secret little spot. Secret? Well, <laughs> Okay, it's not such a big secret, <laughs> but I can give you a few little hints, tell you that it's an hour and a half, two hours away from Darwin, and it's only become a national park since 1984. Before then, it was a tin and copper mine, cattle property, a few other things. But since 1984, it's actually become a very well-known national park. Yes, now I wonder if anyone knows what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm betting a few people do by now. <laughs> so Litchfield National Park is another one of our favourite spots. It's a little different to Kakadu National Park. So Litchfield National Park is a high elevated um, sandstone area. And what's interesting about it is because it is um, elevated, there is quite a few waterfalls and swimming holes in there. Yeah, and it's quite the contrast to Kakadu because Kakadu, well, let's say it. You'd probably be a little bit crazy to swim in most places in Kakadu. Yeah, Kakadu's. it's only about one or two that you could swim there, yeah. eh? But Litchfield National Park, I dare you not to jump into some of these water holes. They're beautiful, they're inviting, and importantly, in the dry season in particular, they're crocodile free. <laughs> I know, I was just thinking, we've been showing a couple of snaps of the old uh, snappy, the cro saltwater crocodiles through this, and <laughs> now we're telling people to go swimming. <laughs> But it's beautiful and you should go swimming there. Yeah. Because as, um, as people may not know, even in winter up this top end, it still gets pretty warm. And particularly if you're from other parts of the world where you're yeah. used, to, used to cooler climates. Now when it's 30 plus degrees, it's pretty good to jump in these water holes. Yeah, so being winter, um, like Kakadu, we want to travel to this area between May and September for majority of people. Now what actually happens in these areas during the dry season, so winter, is that the rangers come in and they check the areas for crocodiles before they're opened for swimming. So even though we're telling you to go swimming, if you see big signs everywhere, don't swim and no one is, uh, don't. So what happens is the rangers check uh, the areas to make sure that there's no crocs left in from the uh, wet season. Uh, they bait and trap and check that there's none remaining. And no then, crocodiles are harmed. No, they're relocated. And then uh, it's opened for swimming. Now what we love is swimming at the bottom of waterfalls, like Wongi Falls. Yeah. Do you yeah. remember that one? And, and there's beautiful walks down to these waterfalls uh, in Litchwood National Park. Most of them are easily accessible for any fitness level. There are one or two that take yeah. a little bit longer. So Wongi is the falls that is really right by the car park. It's just a couple of steps and you can get straight in there, which is yeah. good for those that don't really like steps. Um, do you know my other favourite spot? No. You don't? I do not. Bully Rock Hole. <laughs> oh, so that's the course. one, that's a cascading water and it bubbles all over you. Do you remember that place? I how could you forget? How many times has that been my office? <laughs> <laughs> She's not joking. <laughs> so we probably should just let people know where Litchfield National Park is. We've been talking about it. <laughs> Might be handy. <laughs> <laughs> so as Russ mentioned, it's about an hour and a half, two hours um, away from Darwin. Again, it's popular for those that are uh, just doing an experience around the top end or mm -hmm. if you're heading off to another place like Brisbane or Adelaide. Now, you can get, on, get to Litchfield National Park on a sealed road. You turn um, off the Stewart Highway and go in past Bachelor, as you can see here on the map. Now, there is an unsealed section at the um, far end of Litchfield National Park, which does create a loop back around to um, Berry Springs, actually. Uh, don't try and attempt that one in your motorhome. It's pretty corrugated, and there's a little section that's really not suitable for your motorhome at all. Um, it gets a bit flooded during the wet season. Yeah, but don't worry, provided you can find your way to Litchfield National Park, you'll never get lost because there's compasses everywhere. They're known as the magnetic termite mounts. Oh yeah. So the reason I say they're the compass everywhere is every one of them are built in a north-south axis. 
So you always know which direction you're travelling in. That's, it looks like a graveyard there, doesn't it? So you might be wondering whether you want a two-wheel drive camper or a four-wheel drive camper when you go into Litchfield National Park. My first question. Hmm. So, um, majority of the areas, or all the areas we're talking about today are on a sealed road, but um, there are a couple of spots that are four-wheel drive only. And so if you're into that, you might just want to take a four-wheel drive, but most people wouldn't really worry about that. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's needed for Litchfield, no. unless you particularly want to go off the, onto the dirt roads, yeah. but there is so much to see and do there without the four-wheel drive camper. Yeah. Oh, we should actually tell people about the camping too, Russell. Yeah, well, it's important to know where you're going to stay when you visit these places, isn't it? <laughs> yes. So at Litchfield, there's uh, there's national park camping, yep. but you do have to be, uh, I suppose, aware that it's first in, mm. first served. Uh, so and it's possible limited, and it is a busy park. Yep. So you're not necessarily guaranteed. But if you are lucky enough to get the national park camping, you're going to be nice and close to Belinda's favourite, oh, yeah. Louis Rockhole, or one of the other um, waterfalls that are there. There's also a few commercial camps that are just outside of the park. Very nice places. In fact, uh, when we're on tours, that's where we Yeah, we, we stay at uh, Litchfield Tourist National Park. Yeah, the one closest to the National Park entrance. And really nice people, great facilities. And these commercial parks, unlike the National Park camping, you know, you've got your power there if you need it. Yep. You've got facilities, you've got all those luxuries that sometimes you want if you're on the road for a little while. Yeah. That was good, just remembering about the old Litchfield National Park, wasn't it? It was. It's you know, quite a different environment to Kakadu. Yeah. and it's beautiful and you get to go for those refreshing swims which is always awesome. Yeah and I can't believe there's no entry fee to get into Litchfield National Park either. No and you know sealed roads you know most of the way mm. and really convenient and easy for everyone to get around. Yeah so for um, a lot of people they probably spend about a day in Litchfield National Park or perhaps two days depending how you're going with your timing. Definitely recommend doing Kakadu and Litchfield, as you can see, they're so different. Yeah, is that right? Absolutely. And what uh, some people do is they might um, call in at Berry Springs on their way, which is um, an old wreck camp from World War II. Oh yeah. yeah. What what would you go there for? Uh, you can go there to swim and picnic. So not able to actually um, camp or anything yeah, there, sure. but it's just another place. Uh, when you're in the top end, it's so wonderful to be able to swim. I think that's one of the highlights for people, apart from happy hour, of course. But uh, swimming, I think, in the top end is something that's quite memorable for a lot of people. Yeah. So we hope you enjoyed our reminiscing of Litchfield National Park. And great area to do as you're, as you're travelling around Kakadu National Park. And uh, really, I think one of our most popular vehicles there is the two berth toilet and shower option. Great for couples, great for people on a budget. And, you know, when you see the layout you can see why it is so popular for so many. Yes, that's right. If you'd like to see more information on any of the motorhomes you've seen through today's happy hour chat, you can take a peek at our website or give us a shout and we'll show you more information and have a chat to find out what you're looking for in a motorhome. One of our motorhomes is a popular Maui and Brits style two berth with a toilet and shower on board. It packs a huge punch as it's seven metres long, has an external barbecue, and the front seats rotate so you can keep your bed made up during the day. You just want to pop onto our website. If you want, you can watch a video that goes into a lot more detail on this specific layout. Or let us know and we can shoot you through the link. We have to say that this specific layout is one of our favourites and it's very popular with our clients too. So that's it for the first Gallivanting Oz Happy Hour Tales with Russell and Belinda. We hope you enjoyed it and we look forward to your feedback. And don't forget, if there's areas that you'd like us to cover in our next Happy Hour Tales, please let us know. Or if you want to hear more about the tips that we use when we're travelling around Australia, join us for the next one. That's right. Uh, so yes, my team and myself are standing by and we're happy to get, answer those questions. But you might also be ready to actually get some information on motorhome hire. Perhaps you already know where you're going. Drop us a note and we'll give you an idea of pricing. And in other good news, if you're interested in our escorted motorhome tours, let us know. So thanks again for watching and happy travels. Till next time.